Looks like it's carried. Adoption of the minutes mover. You'll need a voice because I can't see y'all. Jeff, I move. Okay, Jeff moves. Seconder. Second, Maureen. Maureen, uh, in favor? Aye. 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 Terry. Public comments. Do we have public comments today? Uh, no. Okay, we have a delegation. Yay. From uh, Fiona and Maria, the Sea Change Marine Conservation Society, about uh, eelgrass planting and middle mooring buoys around Bowen. So, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. You guys can um, run the presentation from your computer. I think Nikki and I tested that. You have the capability. Yeah, we should be able to. Maria will share her screen. Okay. Perfect. All right. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. And thank you for inviting us to your meeting. Um, I'm Nikki Wright. I'm uh, speaking from the West Saanich unceded territory of Brentwood Bay, which is just north of Victoria. Um, I'm an executive director of Sea Change Marine Conservation Society. We were founded in 1998. And our mission, which uh, has been persisting for 22 years, is basically marine conservation, education, and restoration. And we've had the honor to work in Howe Sound for, gee, six, eight years or so, um, and getting to know the community, uh, both under the water and above it and on land. Um, and we've been focused primarily in Howe Sound around near shore habitat restoration. So I want to thank you for contributing to that, uh, especially to Bonnie and to the committee for um, giving us the opportunity to make a, a video that's gonna be very important for the conservation of these habitats <clears throat> and for contributing to the eelgrass restoration that we plan to do in Manion Bay. So could you, uh, progress it. There we go. So we're just going to briefly outline what we do, which I think I just basically did. Um, do you have any questions about sea change at all? It's pretty straightforward. It's kind of, if you get down to the mission, it's kind of a boring organization because we're extremely consistent. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's marine conservation, education, and restoration. Um, and then we'll go into discussion of what this has to do with Manion Bay and the conserving of the habitats there, and then the collaborative um, project ideas that's coming up that are very, very exciting, and then questions. Next slide. So basically that's kind of our vision, um, creating a world where nature is part of our daily reality and that we're not separate from it, um, that we're all part of nature. And to bring up uh, generations of uh, children and youth that understand diversity in all its myriad forms. Um, so that picture there is really wonderful because it's your community helping to restore eelgrass um, just a, a little while ago, a few summers ago, in all kinds of weather. And what we're finding is that the energy to do this work is um, growing exponentially, that in a kind of a gloomy time where the future looks uncertain. Many, many more people, including youth of all um, backgrounds are, are coming to estuaries and bays and beaches trying to make a difference. And we're really looking forward to continuing working with them and bringing up another generation in leadership to continue um, progressing this movement. Next slide. 
So why eelgrass? Probably most of you now know why eelgrass is important. Otherwise, you probably have a hard time understanding why you're helping to fund the restoration of this habitat. <clears throat> but basically, it, it's an underwater meadow that serves as the grounds for refugia and food and um, shelter for salmon on both ends of their lives. In the younger stages, as they're coming out of places like Tribune, to uh, coming back to spawn. They use it as um, a place of shelter and to um, become robust if they're young, going into the deeper ocean. Um, and these eelgrass habitats <clears throat> also store carbon very efficiently, perhaps more uh, than forests. If you combine them with mangroves and wetlands, it's called blue carbon and they have an incredible efficiency in storing carbon under the earth. So it's not just um, vulnerable to the ocean uh, fluctuations and moods. It also helps to restore uh, property and restore all those values that many of us came to live close to um, the, the, uh, the amazing riparian areas, the shellfish, all the vegetation on the near shore is protected by kelp and eelgrass because it slows down the action of waves. So it has both human values as well as an ecological value. And as I mentioned at the introduction, they're really not different, they're the same. So if we preserve these habitats, we're serving ourselves <coughs> with kind of a type of green infrastructure, if you will, as well as conserving all the crabs and clams and shellfish and Pacific salmon and herring that use these habitats in some part of their life stages. Next one. So I'm gonna hand it over to Fiona to explain to you how we're doing the restoration, why Banyan Bay is one of those centerpieces for our work. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, so thank you all for inviting us to Give a presentation today. I'm excited to um, speak about the projects that we're proposing and answer any questions you have. Um, I am the regional coordinator for Sea Changes program called the Salish Sea Nearshore Habitat Recovery Program. Um, and I'm going to give you a brief overview on what we've done so far in Howe Sound at Katsum, which is the Squamish Nation, one of the Squamish Nation place names for this region. Um, speak a bit about why Manion Bay is such an important and unique area to be doing this work. And then Maria and I will both walk through our project ideas. So with the Nearshore Restoration Project, there's four different regions in the Salish Sea that Sea Change has been conducting eelgrass transplant, subtidal debris removal, and marine riparian restoration over the past three years and for the next two years. In Howe Sound, we held a community meeting in May of 2018 that Bonnie and Sue Ellen participated in. And during that meeting, we identified 110 potential sites to do restoration in the sound, which is what you see on the map. Um, in front of you. Manion Bay was one of those sites and was kind of elevated through a series of subsequent meetings with a technical working group to be one of 12 sites that we identified as being really good candidates. Um, so over the past few years, we've conducted surveys at those sites, um, habitat surveys, field work to really like drill down into why those places could be potential restoration sites. Um, and last summer we visited Manion Bay and we confirmed that it was really a great site. Why is it a great site? For many of the reasons that you see on your slides. Top of the list is the fact that the municipality and the community has already done so much restoration here and that the socio-ecological framework already exists. Um, it's incredible to be working in a region where the government and the communities acknowledge the intricacies and the interconnection between social and ecological structures um, and communities. And that's really what our work can build upon so well. Um, also the fact that you've already done a lot of the work to clear the debris and address the mooring boy um, legislation is really valuable. Um, this has led to a really high community engagement and also literacy and understanding of the value of these marine systems. You know, it's cool to see the videos of the chum salmon and the coho salmon spawning up Terminal Creek and all of the children that go and watch, um, watch the salmon make their way up to the causeway and the site that we're proposing for doing restoration is right next to that causeway. So it means that the juvenile salmon that, that kids release in the, at the hatchery up Terminal Creek can flow through and spend some time in that, in that meadow. Um, 
Manion Bay has really good ecological potential. The salmon exists there. The beaches are potential um, forage for spawn fish spawning. And also these are, as you know, one of the top um, visited and used public beaches on Bowen. So it's neat to um, have all of that, have all of those criteria kind of align in this area. And it really adds the value to doing this restoration work. Um, but of course, through the lens of climate change, uh, that is why we're here. Um, ecological restoration of eelgrass, as Nikki pointed out, can help to attenuate wave energy, but it can also help to store sediments um, and reduce erosion. So those beaches, hopefully with more eelgrass in the bay and more continuous and rich habitat, um, we can help to slow any erosion that might be occurring due to climate change induced sea level rise and storm frequencies. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit about the, the regional context and why we're so excited about Manion Bay. The two projects we're going to go through today um, kind of speak to the main objectives we have, which is to build this region's resilience to climate change. Uh, the first project is a restoration of the health of eelgrass near shore habitat um, that will support hundreds of marine species, protect our shorelines and help to sequester carbon. And then the second project that Maria will go through is um, building on that to strengthen our resilience by implementing best practices and really encouraging humans to be better, to be smarter and to build better and just act more like more respectful um, citizens in this socio-ecological system that we're part of. So um, diving into the first project, this is our restoration idea. So as I mentioned, through the restoration project, we do debris removal, eelgrass transplants, and marine riparian restoration in Manion Bay. The eelgrass transplant is what we're really excited for um, and what we identified during our surveys last summer. So um, on the slide, you see a map and I've dropped a pinpoint. It's really small in blue, which is the site where we, um, we found a gap in the, in the eelgrass bed that we would like to fill um, by doing our transplants. And we, um, in general, over the, through this project, our, our method is to conduct a pilot transplant with around 750 to 1,000 shoots. And then we monitor that over the next year to assess the, the success or the failure. If it's successful, then we can return to that site and um, transplant more plants. Um, and the eelgrass transplant essentially involves getting donor shoots from a healthy, um, and nearby meadow, and then bringing them to the, to the site that we want to restore, working with community members to prepare the shoots, which involves tying washers to each shoot, and then divers go and embed the shoots within the sediment. And then over time, the eelgrass reproduces clonally and will kind of fill in the gaps and lead to this beautiful flourishing connected meadow. So I have a bit of a timeline. Oh yeah, if you wanna just stay on that side for a second, Maria, thanks. I have a bit of a timeline here for um, the stages of this transplant um, initiative. And so we would do the, ideally the, the pilot transplant this summer. We'd follow that up with a, about six to eight months of monitoring and community engagement. Community involvement is a really core component of this project because it can inspire people to connect more with their, with their ecosystem and also become better stewards of the near shore gardens. Like a restoration event is a one-time thing, but the maintenance of those ecosystems requires ongoing um, good behavior by the people who live in the Bay um, and who can kind of monitor when we're not around to figure out whether the shoots are still, still doing well. So that'll happen fall 2020 into the spring of 2021. And then hopefully we could return next summer and conduct a second transplant. So I think I'll hold off on any questions. We can have questions at the end of this presentation and now I'll pass the mic over to Maria who's gonna go through the second project. Hi everyone, um, I'm Maria. Um, I'm the project manager for the Mooring Project. Um, I have a background in behavioral science and ecological restoration. I serve um, some other roles with sea change in research and communications uh, capacities. And I also work with Pacific Salmon Foundation where I research the importance of nearshore and estuarine habitats for Pacific salmon, uh, climate change impacts to these habitats, um, restoration strategies that are adapting to these changes and the importance of habitat connectivity. So I'll be discussing project two um, the grass friendly mooring buoys. Um, and so uh, cumulative stressors impact the health, integrity, and resilience of eelgrass habitat. And areas where eelgrass is present is often in calmer bays and typically suitable areas for boaters to find refuge from exposure to high energy waves and currents. When boats are tempor temporarily anchored, we recommend that, that they anchor out deeper and outside of eelgrass beds. 
And when moorings are permanent or not feasible outside of the eelgrass zone, we can repurpose those, the cement blocks with seagrass friendly moorings. Traditional mooring systems with chains attached to cement blocks cause a scouring of the seabed with the chain dragging as the boat moves with, when the tide ebbs and flows. This mechanical disturbance causes gaps and overall declines in eelgrass um, extent and densities. And so as you can see on the right part of the slide, here's an example from Richardson's Bay, California. Um, they quantified the damage to be between 0.2 to 0.3 hectares of eelgrass um, damaged on average by each boat. Um, this fragments and impacts the habitat's ability to play critical ecological roles. So uh, introducing seagrass friendly moorings to Manion Bay. Um, community engagement events will take place and we will um, work with interested boaters to install these new mooring systems. The designs contain a midline float that holds a rope above the sea floor to eliminate scouring. It is measured to depth and accommodate tidal changes and can allow for the regrowth and con continuity of eelgrass habitat. Um, it can help lessen our footprints uh, with better boating practices and it can help mitigate stressors that can help habitats, eelgrass habitats stand a fighting chance as they face unprecedented changes in climate and increasing the health, integrity and resilience of these ecosystems. It will support the ability to provide un un uninterrupted habitat for a whole host of marine life, such as juvenile Pacific salmon who benefit from time in the nearshore environments like eelgrass, who not only utilize these salmon highways as migratory corridors, but as software habitat as well, um, where they uh, acclimate to new saline waters and where they consume the energy dense prey they depend on for growth in this critical early marine period. Our dive team will monitor the natural recovery of the scarred areas over time and capture footage along the way. So community engagement is the cornerstone of the success of this project. Community members will have the ability to actively participate in the solution, taking on roles as, res of, as uh, volunteer restorationists and spreading the word through boater to boater educational outreach video. Um, we want to create a legacy product to showcase how Manion Bay is a model for other coastal communities and building resilience to climate change. Our hope is that this will create waves with other coastal communities who will adopt similar practices, helping to conserve critical nearshore habitat and towards supporting the conservation of Pacific salmon. And so our proposed funding allocation, um, we would appreciate allocating some funds towards creating the boater to boater educational outreach video, as we see this as an important step in nurturing community-based stewardship and may create larger change through ripple effects in other coastal communities. The funding would help us with travel and logistics, as well as time for staff for post-editing production. And for um, another uh, part of that uh, funding, it would be towards um, eelgrass restoration materials. Thank you all so much for giving us this time today to present. Um, it takes a village to protect the health and resilience of coastal, social and ecological communities. And we thank you for your support, energy and accomplishments. Um, and we wanna know if you have any questions. So I, I guess I have a question. It's Will Husby here. And it's um, so that just to clarify, the, the ask is what was in your previous slide, um, uh, the money for the uh, uh, creation of the video and uh, um, some materials for, for restoration, correct? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Any, uh, any questions from uh, committee sure, I members? A, I have a question, Will. Um, David? Thank you very much for this presentation. It was really great and I really support both of these efforts. Um, so it's following up from what Will was just saying. So my understanding then is your organization is already doing the work on the eelgrass. You're getting 500 bucks to help you a little bit with some of the materials. So really then most of the money is going towards the um, uh, the mooring boys, the seagrass friendly mooring boys, which is which is fine, but I'm not quite sure what you're doing with this video. And you're saying it's to do with Manion Bay, but 
I, I guess I need a little bit more information about the video. Are you involving the people of Manion Bay in this? And then there's, and there will some of the boys be replaced um, in this video? Is that is that how it works? Help me understand a little bit about how the Mooring Boy program works with Manion Bay, please. Do you want me to take that, Maria? Sure. So as part of the project, we do habitat surveys um, from the suggestions from the community and the technical working groups. And so we use cameras and sometimes divers to look at the state of the near shore um, and the restoration suggestions coming from the community. And so when we went into Manion Bay, we did dives and underwater um, footage of where the breaks were in the eelgrass. And so we noticed where the scouring was going on and making those gaps. Um, and so when we're doing the video, we'll be showing that damage and then going through the process with uh, boat owners about changing over to a more eelgrass friendly system and then monitoring and, and videotaping the changes that go on with the increase um, growth of the eelgrass. So change over time. So it's, gonna, it's a video that, that goes from the damage to the solution to the change over time. We're also gonna be doing this in another uh, community of Ford Cove on Hornby. So there'll be two communities where we're showing the advantages of doing something better and being a steward of their own Anchorage site. And then we do a lot of public presentations and outreach as part of our restoration project that's going on for another two years and probably longer. And so this kind of video goes into, it's like that ripple effect that happens with a big splash. It will go into a lot of coastal communities. Does that answer your question? Uh, that answers it really quite well. Uh, uh, so just <laughs> make sure I'm fully understanding it. So this is a video that you're going to be developing that will be then used all over the place because you're doing it before, how to fix it and after, which That's is right. re really a great story. So, but in terms of the fixing it, I don't see any money for fixing it. As somebody, let's say Mr. Smith owns, um, has one of these boys and a nice boat attached to it. So does Mr. Smith decide, yeah, yeah, let's do this. I'll pay for it. Or how does that work? So we did get some money from the Pacific Salmon Foundation to help pay for the cost of these units. Okay. So if a boat owner did agree to, to go through this change, they would be responsible for half the cost okay. of the actual system. And okay. then we'll be monitoring the change and he'll be, he or she will be monitoring the change in the habitat over time. So there's great boater participation and half the cost of yeah. the unit itself. Okay, that's a really good explanation. It sounds like a terrific project. Um, okay. And the funding you have to work with um, boaters, is that just for one boater or a couple of boaters, a couple of boys? Uh, any thought, any info Great. on that? We have up to 12. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, so we're hoping to make a big impact, not only on the habitat, but on that ripple effect of influencing other boater. There's a lot of boaters out there who really wanna do the right thing. And we okay. want to be part of that movement that says, here's what we could all do together rather than this is what you're doing wrong. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for your very good answers. Um, I fully support both projects. Thank you, David. Can I just um, jump in? I just wanted to, David, just to answer your question too. Um, Ivor Kerr from Cormorant Marine, he has installed a couple of these mooring boy systems. So, you know, we, he knows the source of where he could a person if they're interested so and it's not that much more expensive than a normal system so there is you know once the education is there if somebody was opting to a, a traditional boy system anchoring system or this new midline float system there is the source there as well and I have talked to some people because morning boys are going in all the time around Bowen Island. Good. Thanks Bonnie. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got a, a question um, Great ideas about the video, uh, and uh, I, I really like that. Um, I've seen a lot of projects that uh, um, have a good product, but it's not not uh, distributed well. So, how how will you be distributing that video uh, 
Um, I'm I'm thinking uh, YouTube and that kind of thing is 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 a good uh, option. But uh, I'd like to hear your um, your thoughts on how that video is going to be distributed. It's it's my philosophy that face to face um, relationships are better than the digital world any day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have been suffering from Zoom overload, so I'm speaking from personal experience. <laughs> yes, so, I understand. Yeah, so I'd say top of the list is personal contact with associations and uh, yachting clubs and educational groups from youth all the way up through grandfather and grandmother age. So that to me is always number one. And number two is the websites that we use. Um, and that the fact that we're working in four different regions in the Salish Sea means that we have a lot of different kinds of contacts in the community that would have access to this video to use wherever they go. So it's not just sea change doing the distribution, it's this virus, if you will, that's spread out in the stewardship community that could really make use of this film. And it's a really good question. I appreciate that. And just well, I've got two hands up. I've got Maureen and Dawn have had their hand up for a while. I don't think we caught what you said there, Steph. Sorry, I've got Maureen and Dawn have had their hands up for a while. I think Maureen was first. Okay, thank you, Dawn. Um, thank you for the presentation and thank you for the uh, explanation. Um, uh, Nikki, you seem to have disappeared. Sorry. Oh, there you are. Good. You're still there. Um, I apologize if some of my questions are redundant. I was bounced out of the meeting for a little while earlier on. Uh, David asked uh, the majority of the questions that I have, but one that I didn't hear um, answered or asked was, what is the unit cost per um, uh, it, seagrass friendly buoy? Um. Nikki, Go ahead, Maria. Um, I can pull that up, but I believe it's around 600 um, and so it'd be half the cost. However, um, we were discussing that if people have the proper um, mooring float that can accommodate this new installation, they won't have to pay for that new piece and that's worth like $250. So it could be quite a small amount um, to contribute, um, but that's something we can discuss with the interested vote voters um, and and go through that. But I think as a whole, it's around six hundred dollars. Okay, Is that correct? Thank you. And um, do we know? And this may be a question for Bonnie. How many um, how many mooring boys are there in Nanyan Bay at this point? There are around, I want to say, I don't have the exact number. I want to say around 30. Okay, thank you. Give or take. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then my second to last question um, has to do with community involvement and engagement. Uh, we do have a, a fair number of people who have been involved in the, in the cleanups in Manning Bay over, over the years. Uh, have you worked with those folks in, in the past and would you be considering them part of the engagement for this project going forward? Fiona, do you want to talk to that? Sure, definitely. Um, so we haven't done, Sea Change hasn't done restoration in Manion Bay yet, so we haven't necessarily worked with the groups, but um, I've heard of a ton of them and we are absolutely wanting to work with them and build upon the engagement that they've already done um, in the Bay. Okay. Sure. We did have a question about any sort of regulations or policies that Bowen has right now with COVID in mind with, in, with community engagement. In the past, like the, the eelgrass transplant we did last year at Tunstall Bay, we had around like 30 people who came out over the course of four hours-ish um, to help with that restoration transplant. Um, the photo on your slide is one of, it's from there. But what are the, what's the state of, of those guidelines right now? Mm -hmm. So we do have a COVID safety plan in place yeah. based on work uh, safe BC. Yeah. And what we've thought about, we, we have done a restoration of the Skeety uh, a couple of weeks ago. 
um, but did not involve islanders um, <clears throat> for the first time ever. Um, what we thought about is to get more equipment so that the physical distancing between the stations when we're doing an eelgrass restoration is in place um, and that we would have sanitary stations and, and do the food um, properly and that kind of thing. <clears throat> so I think it's possible. It's just a matter of investing, having the space to do a larger um, work area and to physically distance and um, use masks if people are uncomfortable. But the fact that we'll be outside has a lot going for us. So were you hoping to begin this right away? Like, yeah. What is the timeline? <coughs> the timeline for the restoration could be July, August. Um, yeah. Bonnie, did you have a, a note about the COVID? Well, I just wanted to say that once, you know, if you had sort of a plan in place, I could run it past our emergency coordinator and just make sure because it would be on our shores and, you know, so we just make sure that everything is being followed. Great. Yeah, I'll okay, I'll send it to you. And then just my final question um, has to do sort of a double barrel question. Um, the, the help that you would require and the staff support, the then municipal staff support, because I'm unconscious uh, that this is not part of the work plan, officially part of the work plan for this year. So um, council always brings up the, the question of what kind of staff time is going to be needed in order to support this project. So maybe that might be a question for Bonnie, more so than for, for you guys. Yeah, so um, yeah, there is limited capacity. Um, definitely could um, supply information of the groups, of people that should be informed or that have been active in the past. Already we've talked, uh, we've met Fiona and Nikki and Maria. And so and I know Fiona's aware of a lot of the action groups and people involved. Um, it is a strategic um, council priority, Manion Bay. And I looked through our island plan and there were four um, commitments. That's what council calls their strategic priorities or commitments. And um, there were four areas within our island plan for 2020 where this initiative fits. Um, Manion Bay being explicitly named as one of the actions in the island plan. So while not directly on my personal work plan, it does fit with environmental initiatives, that sort of catch all sort of category. So again, and I, I think, you know, I put it, put it out there, I think Fiona and, and Nikki and Maria know that our Carlism, my, our capacity isn't huge, but we definitely can be that conduit and we can make sure that communications go out um, where appropriate through our channels of dissemination and help with the logistics. Okay. Thank you, Bonnie. Good answer. Thanks. Don is next, I think. Yeah, I think most of my questions were answered, so thank you. I, uh, I guess it, it, regarding the video, I think it's a great idea. And, uh, you know, while one-on-one -on -one is a great idea and always better, you know, I'm, I'm sure you'll do, you'll do well on social media, uh, making sure that it gets lots of uh, views. I just wanted to uh, thank you for your time and presentation. I really enjoyed it. And I'm and, and most appreciative of the thoughtful approach. Uh, it's a well done project. Thank you. Thank you, Don. I, I've got a, a, a question about the future. And I think it, it, it involves Bonnie mostly, but uh, um, as someone who um, uh, swims in uh, Manion Bay regularly, uh, I notice that uh, there's on the weekend, there's a whole bunch of uh, people coming in in boats and just dropping anchor. And I, I hate to think that uh, all this great work being done on um, uh, restoration of eelgrass in Manion Bay could be uh, um, really have a big setback on a long weekend, just with the the number of people uh, dropping their hook uh, in an eelgrass bed and, and uh, uh, doing uh, instant scouring. And so 
I'm wondering if there's some some uh, some future moves that uh, the municipality could do about um, you know my my first thought is um, having uh, designated uh, guest mooring boys that would be set up and that it would be that would be the way that people would be expected to uh, do their uh, uh, day trip uh, uh, mooring instead of dropping an anchor. Um, it could be uh, uh, again. It's it's beyond my ken about the legal ramifications and the, uh, uh, the the exact powers the municipality has in Manion Bay. I know it's 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 uh, it's been extended to, to some extent. So I'm going to shut up and, and see what uh, Bonnie and and uh, the Sea Change folks have to say. Um, maybe, maybe Nikki and Fiona and Maria, maybe you have some comments, what other communities have done. Um, I know that we could put out some informational buoys with some signage, um, again, using our communication network. And also what Nikki was alluding to earlier about dissemination of the video, working with the boating community is key here. Um, yeah, but I would love to hear about what what sort of measures are in place in other communities to protect their eelgrass beds? Well, I am so happy you asked that question because Manion Bay's problems are magnified 10,000 fold. And as our population increases along the coast, we're getting to the tipping point of, um, of, uh, of all the impacts that that connotes. So, we do have signage there that apparently were done by local youth. Um, the problem with signage on the shore is that boaters anchor and then they come to shore and it's after the fact. <clears throat> There's this wonderful community in Anacortes that for years struggled with permitting to get in water signage. Thank you, Maria. No problem. And it's not just yeah. one, it's a yeah. whole series that demarcates the eelgrass habitat near the town. Yep. <clears throat> and they successfully have conserved that habitat with that signage. It is truly amazing. It's something I would love to see duplicated in Canada. Mm -hmm. It's not a navigational hazard and it's a voluntary, um, but you know how nobody jaywalks in Victoria and everybody puts on their seatbelt, right? It's creating the culture in the boating community to be found upon if you went past that and anchored inside. And you would yep. notice that none of your neighbors are inside that zone. So it's something that maybe further down the line, we can work with you about you being a pilot because you have a license of occupation. Maybe we could make this possible here in Manion Bay to show what a great thing it is. It's, it's just, uh, it's been in place for years and it takes community vigilance and upkeep. Um, and that is a downfall that there are divers out there who disentangle people's lines sometimes and get entangled with those buoy markers. But for the most part, that whole continuous bed of eelgrass is perfectly conserved because of that in water mm -hmm. sign. So I'm so, so glad you brought that up because communities have a hard enough time just saying, okay, we'll put some signage on the wharf, which is too yeah. late. <laughs> it's a great idea. It's a great idea. We'd love, we'd love to get it in the water somewhere so that we could show people what a great thing it is. Yeah. And, and I, I can see um, partners with groups like the Bowen Island Conservancy uh, may be able to uh, 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 get some funding for that kind of initiative uh, uh, and perhaps some other groups too. So, thank you. Uh, you just made yeah. my day. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of eelgrass. It's uh, oh, that's great. Uh, <laughs> because you're in the water, swimming in it all the time. Yeah, and and as as well, uh, uh, I was one of the, the co-authors of, of Bowen's uh, Marine Atlas, and and. Uh, uh, you, you can't help but be uh, immersed in, in the value of, of 
features like uh, eelgrass when we've uh, uh, worked on, on that kind of project. So. Yeah, that's right. I just noticed Michaeli's oh, hand oh, up. Michaeli, yes, sorry. Thank you. Um, I just, you had mentioned that the project, the restoration portion could take place between July and August. Um, I would imagine it doesn't take a full two months to do, so I wanted to get an idea of, of how long it would take, and maybe this is something that we could push off a little later if it only takes, you know, a couple of weeks to um, avoid um, or maybe when things are getting back into sort of um, the bubbles are opening up a little bit more to allow for this sort of planting. Yeah, that's a um, great question. So the actual the actual day of restoration event takes with the community um, takes a couple hours. Uh, so it's not too long that that portion. Uh, we generally the divers will harvest the shoots the day before so that they're as fresh as they can be. You want to minimize the amount of time that the yellow grass is out of water because that reduces the success of the transplant. So we harvest them, prepare the shoots and then put them back in the water ideally within 24 hours to 36 hours. Um, the bulk of the time portion is just like the planning and the organization and the logistics. So that's why we set that range. It's also all weather dependent. So even when we when we set a, a week, it might be that the weather prohibits the team from coming over from the island or this or that. Um, but as you saw from the picture in our slides, even if it's crazy, windy, rainy weather, we'll, we'll try to be out there with the volunteers preparing the shoots. Um, yeah, and the the seasonality, it's it's great to do the transplants in the summer because that's when eelgrass grows the most. It's the sunniest time of year and, and they need the plants need lights to grow. We've done um, restoration transplants in the sound as late as October two years ago, but those transplants were slightly less successful than the ones that we did in the summer, which is why we try to prioritize that timeline. Any more questions from uh, committee members? Well, I want to thank our delegation. Um, uh, I think Don said it best. Uh, it was it was a great presentation and a really important project. And uh, uh, thanks for for uh, coming and telling us about it. Thank you all for having us. Really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You want so, to stop the call now? <laughs> yeah, what I'll do is uh, we're going to discuss later in the meeting. And so I'll be in contact with you tomorrow. Okay. Awesome. Thank you all. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. you so Bye. much. Have a good day, Thank guys. Work. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye now. Bye. Well, we have a recommendation here. Um, well, I rewrote it a little bit because it looks like yep. it's not a thousand dollars for eelgrass and a thousand dollars for the boys. That's not what I saw on the yep. slides. Yeah. So I just changed it to two thousand dollars to eelgrass restoration and midline more and boys initiatives in yep. Canadian by Sea Change Marine Conservation Society. Is that any? Okay? Yep. And any discussion from committee members? Could we? Could we put in there um, that the public education involves producing a video? Because we sort of get generic references to public education a lot. And yeah. if it were specified, so $1,500 to produce a video to provide public education, it would help clarify for council, I think. It's a good project. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think. Uh... Uh, you know, I, I expect everybody uh, on the committee has uh, uh, good feelings about this project. Uh, I certainly do. Uh, any more discussion needed before we uh, make vote on, on that recommendation? Jeff? Yeah, I do, Will. Um, as we'll be talking a little bit later in the meeting about the evaluation criteria, that we've put together and although I think we're I think we're, we're heading in the direction of we've got kind of two uh, amounts of you know care funding or two bins of it and we're prepared to I think it, it 
correct me if I'm wrong, but we're heading toward that first, um, you know, doing some kind of direct award for the first couple of thousand. As a as a formality, should we be running through our evaluation criteria with these with these projects or this project, knowing that it's going to score very well and having worked on it with of course, the subcommittee that uh, I know that it would score very high, but is there a formality to do that? Or or is what we've developed something that will be used solely for the more public um, competitive process? McKaylee uh, has her hand up. I like the idea of practicing just to see how our thing runs through. <laughs> more for an ex experience for us to see how well it works. Yeah, the, my my um, my concern about applying the the criteria at this point is that um, uh, it's um, it's not ready yet. You know, it, it hasn't been reviewed and uh, 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 approved by the committee as a whole, and so. Uh, um, my only, I'm I'm just a little uncomfortable about uh, making it a you know the the application came in before we got uh, finished on on the the, the process of, of uh, approving the the criteria. So, are we is 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 it fair to uh, apply it almost retroactively uh, on a, on an application? I don't know. I'm just. Well, you could ask that question the other way. Is it appropriate to approve a project that hasn't gone through a process? Well, this has gone through the same process that pretty well every other CARIB grant has gone through and that okay. have made a presentation to the group or has made a presentation to a smaller group that then made a recommendation. So I think this has been as rigorous as anything else we've ever awarded funds okay. for. Okay. And I, I agree with Will. I think that they they made their presentation to us, but if you were aware that there were a set of criteria, you gear your presentation differently to try to match. So it, it, there, there's an element of it being a wee bit unfair. I think they got pretty process. close, though. No. Yeah, they got they very got close. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure they did. I'm yep. sure they did. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So. My, my, I'm, I'm going to side with Maureen on, on this. Uh, uh, it, it has followed the procedure of, uh, of past um, applications. Uh, and I think what we've decided to do is for this coming session to start being a little more um, uh, process oriented and, uh, and have a uh, a transparent uh, set of criteria before the uh, applicant makes the application. Right. So are you going to make a motion? I'm, I'm, <laughs> thank oh. you. <laughs> I'm going to make a motion that we uh, uh, follow the recommendations uh, as, as uh, uh, modified by Steph. I'll second and, that. <laughs> Okay, and uh, any dis any more discussion? In favor? Aye. 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 Carried. It was a great presentation. It yeah, was. It was really good. Very impressive. And uh, you know they 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 have a a, a great track record too. Yeah. So. Okay. And if they're watching on YouTube, congratulations. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. All right. Um, new business. Has uh, everybody read that uh, report that uh, Councillor Fast passed through? Yep. Yep. Um, I think it's she's uh, made a couple of recommendations that uh, uh, we might consider. I see three actions. If we look at page nine of 16 on, uh, on our um, agenda, um, there's the uh, first 
a full new paragraph is uh, ECAC could request uh, something similar to the paragraph below that uh, she's identified. Um, and it's basically paraphrasing the, the uh, what was uh, what's in the um, Gibson's uh, um, report on uh, economic uh, report. And so any comments on that? Um, I've got a comment in. Um, thank you, uh, have I got my speaker on? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I thought, now I, I've read Sue Ellen's report and I'm very impressed. It's a really good report, but I haven't had time to go through all the links, but I, but the, um, but I, I think the recommendation is a really good idea because it just simply, it, it puts it out there that we have these natural assets, they're not being counted and they should be. And um, we all know that, but it's nice to have a reminder and make that a public statement. Mm -hmm. Maureen? My question had to do with who writes the notes in that report. And I'm not sure it's our, our staff. Is it not the auditors that provide those notes? So huh? are we asking council to direct the auditors to include this? That's a good question, Maureen. That, yeah, that, that's beyond my kin on, on that. Um, I, I don't know uh, the ins and outs. Yeah. Um, and I, the, the, the uh, italicized um, comment, um, I agree, but I, I don't see, I don't see that coming out of an auditor's mouth. I see it in some, yeah. some other, other context. Um, well, it, I, I guess my, my only comment, Maureen, is that um, that is basically what is in the uh, financial report for Gibson's. It, 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 this has been Bowenized. So um, I don't know how, how if, if it's from an auditor, maybe it's an auditor that, that needs to be cloned. Um, I, I guess yeah. I've got an idea here, here, Will and Maureen, is that, you know, we're, we're making a recommendation to council, like, so we're not telling the auditor to do anything. So our recommendation to council would be to explore the, you know, we, we then talk to staff who actually know how to do this, um, to explore the option of, and, and then, you know, words to this effect. In other yeah. words, to explore the option of having our financial statements include um, a, a statement um, uh, regarding disclosure of natural assets, or words to that effect. I don't have the words in my head, but we ask, we'd send this note uh, to council, council could then discuss it, council could see Sue Ellen's report, and, and we'd have you know, the uh, CFO able to comment on this about how it might actually be done, and then council can decide what to do with it. Yep. Uh, Steph. This did come up with the Finance Advisory Committee and yep. the auditor made a comment on it, um, which is a little bit vague to my recollection, but something to the effect of there are no provincial guidelines at the moment for natural asset um, assessment. So she is not uh, super keen to incorporate natural assets as part of the financial reports. I don't see that that would be, that that would mean that she wouldn't do a note though. So I do think it's first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think um, the, the uh, initial uh, from from reading uh, Councillor Fast's report, my takeaway is that the first step is to use the notes as the uh, the, the first step, and th and that leads up to uh, um, more incorporation of of, uh, of real data into into financial reports as, as time passes. Michaela, did I see you put your hand up there? Or, or, no, okay. Don, do you have any comments? I'll get to you, Carla. No comments, Don. Okay, Carla. Um, just looking at this over again, it says that this is in their 2018 annual report. Yeah. Um, we, we write the annual report. 
we can just put it in there somewhere. It doesn't have to be like embedded in the finance statements if that's something we can't change. We can put a note somewhere in the annual report. I don't see why it couldn't be included. Okay. So any more discussion on that action? I think that the recommendation has to actually say something more about the why we're doing this. Because if you read it on its face, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't explain why. Yep. So something like, and this is, this is not great, um, that the Environment and Climate Action Advisory Committee recommend that council direct staff to include a reference, and then you could say, e.g., a note disclosure to natural assets and their contribution to the infrastructure of Bowen Island or something like that. Yeah. McKaylee, you had your hand up? Yeah, I did this time. Um, in the webinar that I took part in last week, there is an organization that does put these natural assets, um, um, sort of an inventory together. It's called MNAI. Yeah. And it, it does have um, a website with, um, there's a link that has a document on it um, that's titled Defining and Scoping Municipal Natural Assets. So there is some guidelines already out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, thanks, McKaylee. I, I was wanting to watch the whole webinar and you only got a portion of it, so I hope to watch the recording. But um, we have where Carla and I and Raj met. When was that? Was that late last year, Carla, we met? Yeah, we met with Michelle Molnor and others from the Municipal Natural Assets Initiative. And it's a great resource and they have some great pilot projects. And, you know, as you say, there is that... Um, some good good material there to pull from. And you know, who knows where we're gonna go with this, but you know, there is those pilot, there are pilot projects available. And Michelle Mulner actually wrote um, our natural capital section in our parks plan. So she was at the time working for David Suzuki Foundation indirectly, and she she's an ecological economist. Very, very um, sort of progressive in that discipline. So, um, yeah, really wonderful resource. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. So, um, where to go from here? Um, we've just got missing some, a noun, um, then I think I've got um, what was um, Maureen, you said their contribution to the blank of Bowen Island. The infrastructure. Thank you. And would you like me to read it again? Yeah. Yes, please. I forget what I said. Okay, that the committee recommend that council direct staff to include a reference to natural assets and their contribution to the infrastructure of Bowen Island, for example, a note disclosure in the 2020 financial statements and annual report. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do we, do we have a motion? A some of. And I'll second it. Okay. In favor? Aye. 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 Excellent. Well, carried. Um, can, can I just add, what I think is really good about this is up until this point, it's always been we can't do this until such time as the infrastructure, um, the asset management plan is put in place. And it's a fake obstacle. You can actually do something, even if it's only stressing the importance of natural assets. That is, that's a yeah. real thing to do. So I really yeah. appreciate that Sue Ellen put right. this together. Yeah. yeah. No. Will, with your ability, uh, with your knowledge of that uh, counselor, perhaps you could thank the counselor personally. For <laughs> I, I will, I will. Um, I've got, uh, I've noted that there are two other actions uh, suggested in on page on the bottom of page 10 of 16 under alternatives. No, oh, um, sorry, just Sue Ellen. Oh, yep, go ahead. Her. I also know her. <laughs> <laughs> well, sorry, you may live with her, but we have this phone thing, yeah. and I went through and decided that the one on the agenda she thought was the best one to to highlight. Yeah, 
but you guys can discuss that. I don't want to get in front of you, but that if you're referring okay. to her wishes, this was the one that. Okay. I, I, I think they're good things okay. to think about. So we, we should at least discuss them. Uh, um, okay. So alternative one is that ECAC recommend that council direct staff to consider including a note disclosure in the next fiscal year's annual financial reporting. And I think that might be the, the one that uh, uh, Maureen is saying is, is done by an auditor. Um, but again, it's in the Gibson's um, uh, model. Excuse me, um, Will. These are the alternatives if we did not accept her initial recommendation. They're yeah. not options that we consider as well as. Okay. Yeah. Good point. Yeah, it's it's just yeah. the, the report format that's yeah. feeding you. Yeah. Then then uh, we we finished discussion on this uh, this topic. Thank you, Maureen. You've uh, uh, saved minutes, hours off of this uh, this session. Okay. So let's go and see what is uh, left in our agenda. A review of the action items. And that's on page. So you mentioned in the email that you wanted to um, discuss the care up by email. Is that what? Oh, yes. Yeah. And so, so that's, that's actually comments on the application. Yeah. And, and I guess that's, that's arising from the, the actions. Um, I think uh, uh, Steph has sent the, the draft um, uh, care uh, criteria, criteria and, uh, and uh, a draft application form uh, that, that uh, our subcommittee has put together. And, um, you know, I, I think it's too much for us to expect people to have read it uh, uh, and, and, and thought about it yet. But I think um, it's, it's ready to be reviewed by uh, the, the, the whole committee. And uh, we'd, I'd love to get your comments uh, uh, from those that uh, are not on the subcommittee. The, uh, the, uh, the, the Big, one of the, the big changes in is in the title. Um, I, I struggled with care uh, as uh, uh, the, the, in the title of a grant without having to spend the time uh, explaining what CARIP is and what it does. And, you know, the, its real function is uh, to make contributions to a sustainable community. Bonnie. And just thank you so much for your work um, putting together some criteria and I look forward to, to looking at that. I just wanted to let the committee know I had a discussion with our new CAO and he was asking about the care up in the process of how we have gone about allotting money and um, his word of advice was um, try to make the criteria a little bit loose. So that because some great things happen outside the box. Yeah. That was basically what he said. So I just want to pass that along. Yeah. <laughs> uh, McKaylee. Just wanted to extend apologies to Bonnie. In reading through the minutes, I realized we dropped you off the subcommittee. We charged full bore ahead and just left yes. you totally out yes. of it. Yeah. Yes. I'm, sorry, I'm so Bonnie. impressed. I'm so impressed. Wow. Well, no, that's well, great. Look at it well, now. That's great. Yeah, yeah. I, I am, I am uh, uh, aghast with embarrassment, Bonnie. Sorry. So... I, I think just, just to finish this, uh, um, please have a look at the, uh, um, what, what we've done. I think we should um, uh, maybe uh, flavor it with Bonnie's point about uh, not being too strict. Um, and, and so keep that in mind. Uh, uh, as I always say, I have strong opinions lightly held, so uh, um, we can make this better with, with the, uh, the comments and, and uh, uh, input from the rest of the committee. Can I put a little um, action item with a deadline on there? Maybe a week to send comments by email? Thank you, yes. Uh, McKaylee. 
sorry, do we, going back to the original, not run a formal um, um, evaluation of the proposal we just received, but just as a practice run to make sure that the evaluation criteria makes sense for the type of projects that we'll receive? Great idea. And, and, and we'll, we'll realize that they didn't know what the criteria were, so uh, uh, we, we can't be uh, um, uh, cruel. Well, we won't be, because it's a great uh, proposal anyway. Exactly. Um, it's purely for internal purposes only, just to make sure the crit criteria makes sense. Yeah. Um, Will, I haven't seen the criteria. Yeah. I'm, I'm missing it somehow. An email from? Me. Okay. There, there should be two documents. And the. When did you send it, Seth? This morning. Oh. I don't see criteria either. I see um, an application, like. Um, yeah, there's an app. It, the, uh, an application. Yeah, the criteria is in the the other the non-application one. It's the the end. Oh, I got it. Uh, the last few pages of the. Um, uh, Got it. Thanks. Okay. The the first document. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Sorry, I usually put ECAC in my subject lines, but it's, it's yeah. okay. So uh, I, we move on from that to um, action items, and I think number one has been looked after. Um, Number two has been acted on, the invite C changed, um, and uh, update uh, 2020 ECAC work plan. Bonnie. I, I think the most up to date is in the agenda package. Okay. So yeah, um, I, okay. I must admit I didn't spend tons of time on it, but I think it's fairly up to yep. date and I will update it you know, ongoing. So shall we go over the, the previous meeting action items? Um, did, I'm sorry, did someone say something? Or is that just feedback from me? Um, uh, Councillor Nicholson uh, talking about uh, having a park interpreter come to uh, the Coho Bon Voyage, which has been canceled. So Sorry, that's- we have the conversation. Bonnie, uh, check with Bowen and transition regarding heat pumps. We've handled that. Yeah, everybody, um, did, did everybody see the email um, from Bowen and transition from Dave Pollard um, about that? And then there is the bulk solar panel buying going on. So yeah. that email was sent out as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, we we're going to uh, discuss topics for climate conversations. That hasn't happened. I'll put that into the ongoing one. Okay. Yes. Um, and uh, Councillor Hawking was going to circulate the Metro Vancouver video about DNA analysis of streams. I did that for the last meeting. Before yep. the last meeting. Yeah. Okay. And we're and future ongoing actions. We still have to uh, uh, keep. Uh, thinking about Carla's work on uh, water grant funding opportunities. And that's that. Thank you, Will. And uh, so I think we come to uh, next meeting to be decided. Any, uh, Steph, any, any? Uh, We're still ideas? on the um, council referral system. Um, yeah, so something might come out of this recommendation to council comes back. Yeah, or, yeah just save up ideas you have. I think communicate yep. by email on this care up application and let Will and I know if there are topics you want to discuss and we'll throw that on next time council refers something. Okay, and uh, I, I've got to say that it was great working with this group again. It's uh, uh, big brains and, and lots of uh, uh, intelligent uh, ideas here. So uh, let's hope we get called again soon. Mm -hmm. Agreed. 
Okay, shall we uh, have a motion to adjourn? We don't need that. David always tells me that, so <laughs> yes, we're done. All right, so long, all right great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Bye now. Take care. Bye for now.